Thank you, Dr. Sanjay Reddy, for this introduction. And uh, I will be discussing a topic which is intensely clinical, intensely clinical. In fact, it touches upon day to day practice, which often the pubs do have some application, but here it is direct application because. I'm still in practice, so I think of a topic like this. So this is the outline of my talk. You see, insulin therapy is always associated with hypoglycemia. It's a little bit I will talk about dangers of hypoglycemia. And how does hypoglycemia arise? What is the genesis of this? How can you minimize it? And then we discuss some special situations. So hypoglycemia with insulin therapy it's always a lurking fear. For example, when you intensify any therapy, like here you see the data of UKPDS, insulin therapy, you see, and you find the hypoglycemia there, you know, and of course, in the intensive group, you will surprise the hypoglycemia will three times. So here you see the double in the standard treatment versus intensive in DCCT, and it is three times more hypoglycemia in intensive. So whenever we intensify treatment, in order to achieve better glycemic goals, you will be facing this problem of hypoglycemia. So how to that is the key to success of our medical therapy, especially insulin therapy. So standard versus intensive you saw here, and of course sulfonylurea and insulin are the time but also the glynides also be careful. So these are the three group of drugs which are more likely to produce. So when you combine them also, you'll have to be cautious. in getting effective glycemic control and it really is overcoming hypoglycemia is the key. Most doctors hesitate to start. Most patients agitate. They heard about bad hypoglycemic episode from some peer the group in some peer group then they would not like to go on insulin. So this is the major barrier to successful insulin therapy. And uh, therefore we have to learn to overcome it. And this is what I'm going to discuss. Dangers of hypoglycemia, I don't need to expand, but give a few new aspects. Remember that hypoglycemia is invariably associated. You see, of course, intensive treatment, it is more, but invariably associated also with weight gain. They go hand in hand. It is assumed that a patient undertakes defensive eating when there is an episode of hypoglycemia. But I have a feeling that it is not the, all the story. As a matter of fact, it does make far more lipid synthesis or whatever it does. And there is really weight gain, which without even much defensive eating. And of course, the cognition we hesitate to discuss that this very bad recurrent hypoglycemia can result in in, in cognitive impairment, you know, we don't ever tell our patients to get hypoglycemia. A repeated one, you can see the hazard ratio for dementia, I see increases. So, so this is this is something we don't discuss often. It can result into you know, increased QTC and lowering of potassium and throw an arrhythmia at night, a nocturnal arrhythmia, and that in bad syndrome in diabetes, you see, is not been described by many investigators but it is felt that it is arrhythmia, then it is you know, undisturbed bad. And if it is hypoglycemia, it is still disturbed bad. So that is bad with disturbed bad and undisturbed bad. You see hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia resulting into a cardiac event. And, and that is mostly arrhythmia because of potassium shift and causing, uh, causing you see, death. And then this can occur only in so, so cardiovascular complication, hypoglycemia can paralyze your marrow reflex sensitivity, you see. So that uh, when you have give anesthesia to a diabetic and we control diabetes during the perioperative period, we are called upon to do that as physicians. And uh, if there is hypoglycemia, the anesthetist is that scared because even the, even the autonomic failure comes, it causes acute autonomic failure. I'm not talking of autonomic neuropathy or autonomic failure. It's an acute autonomic failure is possible with hypoglycemia, which we don't recognize as much in clinical. Hypoglycemia can throw all the interleukins and, in, and damage the endothelium. And now we know the more and more data are emerging that whenever there is more hypoglycemia, that particular cohort, if you follow, 
versus one without much hypoglycemia, you will find more cardiac events. And, and there are cardiac events associated with a bad hypoglycemic episode soon after that in near future. So all this is being reported now. We have to be acutely aware of this. And I think we just have to learn how to avoid. Again, standard versus, you see, so whenever you do intensive treatment, like you were tried in ACCORD, ADVANCE, and VADT, the trial studies we keep discussing, and there was attended by a lot of hypoglycemia. Whether the increased mortality in a ACCORD study on the basis of which the study was terminated prematurely was associated only the hypoglycemia group is not sure. But in the, if you look at differently, those who had hypoglycemia itself, they did have increased mortality. So, so I think in, in a sense, it can aggravate cardiovascular disease. This is very important to know. So what do we learn from this? We learn from this that without, at the, the, the end of this slide, there are two important lines, you see. Without pre-existing cardiovascular disease, intensive control is beneficial. But with pre-existing cardiovascular disease, intensive control can be detrimental. Now, that, by that I mean highly intensive and highly ambitious, where you are trying to target a even c below six. You know, in a, in a group of patients who already have 10 or 15 years of diabetes with cardiovascular complications. But by this we learn that early, as you heard Dr. Kunti just a while ago, that early treatment, it is possible to intensify. And as a matter of fact, that is a situation where treating diabetes is extremely easy. You can reach your target so easily in first five years of diabetes, type two diabetes. I'm primarily diabetes today. But you see, when you, when you try to do that initially, results are excellent. Results are excellent. Newly discovered diabetic, they have beautiful response to whatever drugs you exhibit, couple of oral drugs, and they are absolutely all right. So that is the area for us to concentrate on if we want to avoid complications. See, so this is the essence of some of these studies that I think you should, of course, change your targets or change your goalposts wisely. That of course, sometimes missed by patients saying that the A1C of 8.5 is okay for me, doctor, have it you read in Times of India, but you should know that the best thing don't appear in, in the newspapers. They appear only in scientific journals. So next slide. Sorry. Um, the genesis of hypoglycemia is very simple. All of you know, this is a glucose profile showing normal in green. And then in, 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 in a red and yellow, you see the diabetic. And then the basal is high, the prandials are high. Both are high. And this is genesis of hypoglycemia. We do differentiate when we're treating people with insulin, basal and prandial hyperglycemia. And we have tools to primarily address one of the two. So we do that. So basal primarily, of course, is, is controls the hepatic glucose production and prandial, of course, controls the postprandial blood glucose or surge of glucose there. And technically, by many of the, what was earlier called biostatter studies, it was shown that half of the insulin we, is used really for the hepatic function. In fact, in the first pass through the liver, almost 50% of insulin is absorbed by the hepatic cells and it obviously exerts its function, its influence there with whatever actions you know on the insulin's action on the liver. So be sure that basal dose is close to 40 or 50%. And I found this as a big error in our prescriptions in our country. And once we examined our prescription about four to four, five years ago, we realized that our basal, even in the basal bolus therapy, had made only about 20, 25% or 30%. So it needs to be at least 40%. This is what most of the most of the investigators say now. And the hepatic insulin extraction, of course, and I hope one day there is hepatoselective insulin, which I'm very much hopeful will occur. And then I think you will have a lot, lot, lot better control of diabetes. So fixing fasting first, sometimes the slogan is there, but remember that when you give good basal therapy also, and we are underusing basal therapy very much. See, Dr. Kunti also referred to that, but in our country, it's grossly underused. You see, after metformin, even, you know, somebody is losing weight, actually you should think of basal insulin right away, instead of exhibiting multiple oral drugs and waiting. So unintentional weight loss is an indication for insulin therapy. Please remember, it is absolutely incontrovertible indication for insulin therapy. And, but we don't do that. But remember that basal itself, when you lower the basal, the prandial also comes down. So there is an overlap between the two. 
when you control prandial beta, there is some interprandial effect, which really is basal period. So these both overlap with each other, and therefore doing efficiently one also can have good impact, and doing efficiently both is required in difficult patients. So insulin distribution, sometimes we don't understand how to distribute our insulin. For example, if the close to 100 units, which doesn't happen, but hypothetically, remember that half of the dose will be for basal between the meals and at night, 32% is 40, 50% of insulin. And meal time, you see, is prandial insulin. And you see, before breakfast, requirement is more than any other meal. This is not recognized in India. The great difficulty, we have been teaching this concept that your dose in the morning has to be higher. Even the meal can be small, but this is the basic body's glucose rhythm, which has to do with hormones and the cyclicity which we have in our body built up, the rhythms that you have built up in our body. And next requirement is probably before dinner dose, usually the lunch dose should be less, although here it is appearing similar. But individually, it can work out very differently. That's why we always, the watchword is individualization. But you have to go by something when you are titrating treatment. And these are the clues for you to go by. And of course, this is what, now you see, basal bolus therapy, again, you see there will be a large dose of regular insulin and less of, you get to use only NPHN for the human regular, which can still be done very economically in our country in patients who cannot afford. And then you know very large amount of basal insulin at night. So this is another very important, but say simple point that if it, it please feel, I've seen the hypothologists, have you seen a patient, patient, uh, you know, keep changing clinics, so they land in my clinic. I see that there are bad lipodystrophy, which are not even detected. I said, did a doctor examine, see your injection sites, and you know, there are bad lipodystrophy, and patient is injecting there. And that gives a very variable response. There is such a built-in variability in insulin response, and this intensifies that variability and you do not get good control, you get hyper. Another principle I want to bring out for you, that one shot of Dupriel or two shots of premix and versus, you know, basal bolus. Now I think we all have graduated into basal bolus. I think any difficult patient type two, you see, you should think of basal bolus. The frequency of injection, now once the patient accepts insulin therapy, really doesn't bother them. It's a little more nuisance than pain. It is only a small nuisance, but in India, we put up with a lot of nuisances. This is, this is not a big nuisance at all. I tell the patient, not many nuisances. You put up with every day. So I think I think this shows that last one, we see glargine with blue lysine three times a day, with, of course, oral agents. I'll discuss that a little later. Using oral agents in a type 2 diabetic, whom we are giving insulin therapy, however refined insulin therapy you want to give, sensitizing oral agent is required. So this is what they did here in the green, you see here horizontal, and this obviously worked better as you can see. So remember that multiple doses should not, you should not have any, any, any reservations in using multiple doses and convincing your patient. You see, they gain so much uh, better control and they are so much more comfortable without hypo hyper. They bless you for it but you must have a capacity to convince and for that you have to be first convinced yourself. Then you see, uh, you know, you, know, you see, you step by increase basal bolus and ultimately, of course, when you go to the full basal bolus where there is three doses of regular or short acting insulin. And remember that what's the best as you see here. So when you give insulin therapy, another thing is don't try to minimize doses. That compromise is bad compromise. You will not be able to achieve good control. See? Then what kind of insulin you use also is important. So the insulin we use, you see, you know, can be, you know, you see uh, human regular versus, you know, an analog has been tried here, you can, as you can see. And human and analogs, of course, work very fast. And now there are faster analog and human regular insulin comes in the peak is uh, peak action is at about one and a half, two hours, and it carries on for four, five, six hours. So remember that there is the interprandial hypoglycemia. Human insulin is more likely to do that. Human regular insulin, that is the problem. The very bad prandial hyperglycemia, you'll have to cover with, cover with the analog, a quick acting analog, you see. There is a lot of interprandial hyperglycemia. I think sometimes human regular will cover better than analog. 
in some of my type one, I tried to change to analog because earlier they were on human regular, and some of them I'm treating for 30, 40 years before analog came and after analog came. You know, I have I have follow up of people, you know, type one of 40 years standing, which not many of us not have had the privilege to treat, you know. And uh, you see, I tried to change, and I find that control deteriorated very badly because the interprandial effect of of uh, of the regular insulin was working, you know. And although I gave glargine or whatever analog, the major analogs were possible at that time because see, all, all these stories stretch over 30, 40 years. So anyway, NPH of course has a problem. It is, a, it is, a, it is not a real ba proper basal. Unfortunately, you see the cost of all others is expensive. But remember, glargine is almost about to come under price control in our country. And I think, although it is not the not absolutely ace if you see very minutely basal insulin, but it is good for all practical purposes. And I think that is what you should use if you have cost consideration. It's uppermost, should be uppermost in our mind, at least in this country, when we realize that the American and European guidelines are worried about the cost. And then obviously we have to worry about the cost all the time. So anyway, so 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 we use better insulin, obviously better basal analog, and glargine was the first uh, basal analog. And I think it is cost wise, it is slowly coming down. Glargine cost is was down. And of course, it is peak less insulin, steady, but it has a very minor peak after six to eight hours. That's why all of us started giving at night. So that morning, that peak can cover the breakfast a little bit. So there is a minor peak there. It is not truly a total peak less, steady concentration, the insulin that gives you steady concentration for 24 hours. So I think we pass on. And remember, that variability of absorption of insulin is tremendous in the body. If you inject at the same side, labo dystrophy, the variability is terrible. See, you can never control that patient properly. But without uh, that uh, uh, ob obstacle or problem also, you can see the one injection, they produce three different profiles or different day. Same individual. And you see intra-individual variation in the same day and sometimes so day to day. So these all variations have been a bugbear of insulin therapy. Not much talked about initially, although it was all known until the better insulins came when they started talking about these old ones, you see. And they, they brought out the data that ours is better. So this happens with all the time. You see, coefficient of variation of insulin response, you see regular insulin, NPH, biphasic. And, uh, and remember, the basal insulins, the long acting ones, has even more coefficient of variation, 30, 40% except the newer ones there are probably getting better and better. But remember the regular insulin overall variation is less. That's why sometimes three doses of, you see, regular insulin is what my professor would, would tell me about 40 years ago or 50 years ago when I was working together with him, you see, he, and, and, and another and assistant, and assistant professor. So you see, so so remember that, you see, there is less hypo, less variability with, with regular and short acting insulins than the basal. Now, this is not a lecture, pharma lecture to you know, tell you more about these beautiful insulin. They are certainly good. Cost is the only constraint. Otherwise, you should use the best. Large in 300, you see. And uh, of course, you see the, 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 the uh, IDAG uh, uh, S part, the S, uh, I'm sorry, IDAG insulin. And that is the, 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 the deglodiac insulin of Novo. Those are obviously the base, best uh, basal analogs we have. If you can afford, they are very good, very steady concentration, going a slightly over 24 hours. So some difference in timing is possible. The one or two hours window is there. You see, you don't have to inject exactly at the same time. So to my mind, if you see these two, the comparison does not really show very massive differences. Slight difference in nocturnal hypoglycemia, slight difference sometimes during the induction phase. Maybe as a clinician, I don't give it importance. I would equate them as equally good as a clinician. See, and looking at the data, mind you, you see. So, so I think you know, similar, you know, even see reduction and all. You can see here comparison of these head on. And I think I think that is a slight difference is being pointed out, but I think they can be ignored by we as patients. Insulin pumps will give a much better stable response, you see, to insulin. The coefficient of variation with insulin pumps is only 1%. It narrows down with this minute-to-minute -minute injection, you see, 
makes all the difference. Very steady, you know, uh, delivery of insulin. So type the one diabetic which I'm not discussing today. If you have problem, ultimate solution is insulin pump, which is the expensive solution. But next to that is a good basal bolus therapy. You cannot cut corners there. You never achieve good control in a type one diabetic by doing that. So so how does pump work? You see, it is the, how it cuts now. The coefficient of variation of less than three percent, some say even one percent. This is what I'm going to purpose yeah, given. After metformin failure, when we have this fire and the and the and the even the SGLT2 inhibitor is not there, you see we consider but basal insulin quite often is not used in our country, which is there as an option. And of course, later on we start using insulin with multiple drug failure. And then of course, remember that some guidelines given by ADA and Oscetra, they'd forgotten. In the end, they said insulin therapy. So some of us, some lectures pointed out, and many others probably they also saw. In the end also is after insulin therapy, there has to be sensitization in a type 2 diabetic. And that is a very important thing in successful insulin therapy. So they added that in later guidelines, sensitizers. You see, which sensitizer will you use? So this is another key to successful insulin therapy. So you would like to use what is shown here as anti-hyperglycemic agents because they are less likely to cause hypoglycemia instead of hypoglycemic agents like sulfonylurea, glynides, and insulin. And these, all the others, they sensitize, some of them are super sensitizers. Others reduce the insulin dose, which in a way ultimately means less insulin requirement. And less insulin requirement divided into three or four doses, like I told you, basal bolus therapy, you see, will obviously avoid hypoglycemia. When you're using big bulk of insulin, and then obviously one day, a little difference in food intake or a little extra exertion by the patient, you're going to get hypoglycemia. So therefore, you have to minimize doses. And minimizing doses, the key is sensitizing agents. So I don't remember out of thousands of my type 2 patients whether I treated anyone with insulin therapy without an oral agent there. So I think it is an essential requirement, sensitizing, because insulin resistance is quite marked in type 2 diabetes. You see, remember that when you get a lot of hypo, you'll have to also revise your A1C targets. And this is from one of our paper we produced, we published on, on in, in the RSA the journal. You see, and uh, and it shows the targets have to be different in different people. And of course, I don't see 8.5 there, but 7.5, 8 I'll accept. But 8.5 is Times of India or Indian Express, you see. And uh, it might come sometimes from abroad, from, from some investigator, and, but it is out of context. You take it out of context by our patients. And remember, this is very interesting here. The last one, pregnancy, this is something new in this paper. You see, I must tell you, I don't know whether any other author has pointed out this. The at least I have not seen. If you can find anybody antedating this paper, let me know. Because these glycemic targets in gestational diabetes versus pre-gestational type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes has to be different. Quite to different. You are treated enough, which some of us have. This comes to you automatically. You see, gestational diabetes is easily controlled with insulin. You see, you know, and you can achieve the target very easily. Pre-gestational type two will require something more, and type one, even less than seven is also with insulin pump. I delivered at least a dozen type one. You know, and and I know how difficult it is. Some of you have done that. You will recall those cases. You see, and getting them seven, six point five are done with insulin pump. But with basal bolus, 7, 7.5 is quite okay. I don't think you'll get beyond that. This is very important to see this because this is something it will not, it is not being talked about anywhere else at the present time. So, so if you have problem in adjusting your insulin to get an insight, yes, ambulatory glucose profile is a good idea. You see, use it at least sparingly because it's all expensive. Type 1, of course, we have to use very often. Those on pumps may have to use very often. But type 2, in order to gain insight. But remember, when you do this, ask patient to maintain, maintain a food activity. Otherwise, it makes no sense. All the funny statistical parameter you get so, so, you know, enamored, fantastic parameter. Timing range, of course, is a good parameter now. And we think that less than 70% should be time, uh, uh, more than 70% should be timing range and less than 4% should be low range. You see, those are the criteria that ADA has recommended now with the help of these 
continuous glucose monitoring. So that's a new criteria and an important one. But remember that your changes will be made based upon activity and food diet. If that is not maintained, it is absurd to go on putting pump and you know try to try to read it, you know, and do anything for birth fire. Drug interactions is important. We don't talk much about drug and drug interaction. In fact, in our country, except some very advanced hospital, there is still no warning for drug interaction. There are 10 drugs being described. You know, the pharmacist is supposed to warn doctor there are three drugs interacting very badly with each other. It is it is not being done. I'm very sorry that we don't learn the real proper clinical aspect because the hospitals are being run by the business management people. So it's very unfortunate. But this is what has happened. It is happening world over. So I think it is a problem. You see, and of course, you see drug interaction. And mainly, please remember, you see, the alcohol, please remember very well. Remember quinine there. You see, very, very notorious by treating malaria. And most important cause of hypoglycemia is the concurrent illness, intercurrent illness is gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis, extremely common because bad hygiene, which we are trying to improve with great difficulty, you see, extremely common. It's the commonest cause of hypoglycemia. You must tell the patient what to do when you have diarrhea or vomiting. Their sick day routine, they have to teach everyone. You see, minimizing hypoglycemia, therefore, you individualize targets, I told you. You see, use, use either SMBG or little, little more intensively, at least in the in the phase, and CGMS once in a while. You see, good patient education to learn the meal, medication, exercise, interaction, this interaction of these three. You see, wider use of anti hyperglycemic drug to sensitize patients to insulin and wider use of reacting and the insulin analogs if it is affordable, mind you. Otherwise, you have to still use human regular and insulin pumps if possible. They're getting better and better, getting semi automated for the digital supply, and hope one day will be automated for the for the boluses, but expensive deal. And developer of insulin, I still looking for insulin, which will give me less variation of this cost. But my hope may be belied for the reason that it may be inherent in the basic our biology, and therefore the insulin levels will not be very constant day to day, even in intra individual, you see, in a particular patient. So this is the thing I've seen in automated pump data, and there also there was coefficient of variation. So I was quite quite, uh, quite uh, disappointed that one day we'll get over it. We worry about weight weight change, weight gain. So this is one study we found showing that weight gain obviously is with insulin more. And insulin is sulfonyl urea, which we use in our country to sensitize patients. Sulfonyl urea is not mentioned as good sensitizers now. But I'm gonna tell you that 40 or 50 years back, there are hundreds of articles using sulfonyl urea as sensitizing sensitizers for insulin, they are superb sensitizers, far more potent than any other sensitizer. But you see, so they can cause bad hypoglycemia. So when I use that, I use something like plain glycoside, 40 to 20 to 40 milligram three times a day. Beautiful sensitization, no aggravation of hypoglycemia. This is the art of sensitizing agent, which one to use and how to use. But otherwise, safely use, you see, metformin and many others for that. Another interesting thing we found, we say that Insulin therapy causes weight gain, but we found that weight gain has occurred mainly, this is close to 500 people, mainly in people who have lost weight before therapy. So weight gain is a function of prior weight loss. It is not a really an a, a attribute of a good, well-planned insulin therapy. And this is a bogus insulin therapy with 80 units morning, 80 units evening, then you'll gain weight because they hypo, 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 hypo. But otherwise, frankly, there should not be much weight gain in a good insulin therapy, insulin pump therapy has not caused much weight gain. In fact, the youngsters know how to control their weight when they are on the pump much better than they could ever do with the beaver basal bolus therapy. A few special situations and I'll finish in time of, you see, nocturnal hypoglycemia is bad, watch for it, watch for it. You see, night, for example, in human regular, and then you give your glargine or whatever basal, and then you get a combination hypo. So then you shift the glargine even to morning, we have started shifting. And remember, sometimes you'll have to use an analog so that you don't get a nocturnal hypo. You see, and and of course, you see the and uh, the nocturnal symptomatic and all that. I think we leave that out. Hypoglycemia during sleep, there is a problem. The counter regulatory responses are impaired in the horizontal position and in sleep. They don't kick in very fast. So recovery from hypoglycemia can be very difficult. 
patient can really go into very bad, sink into very bad hypoglycemia. So you have to be very careful about what therapy you are giving in the evening. You have to be very, very careful about that. And I wouldn't say 3 a.m. my blood sugar, but very smart is between 2 and 4. Because very large number of people wake up once at night and that time is between 2 to 4. So I say between 2 to 4, anytime you wake up, once in a while, once a week or so, please do a blood glucose, especially in intensified therapies. And in type 1, you have to do that, as it as was done in this CCT study, as you know very well. You see, so, so fasting blood glucose shows that there is nocturnal hypoglycemia. Fasting blood glucose very good on one day, very bad. One day it is 90, and the other day it is 250, and it goes on swinging like that. It is indicator that at night patient is undergoing nocturnal hypoglycemia. And these are and the surge you have in the morning is probably post hypoglycemic hyperglycemia. So this is interesting. So I think uh, this is another important concept I want to tell you that with age the hypoglycemia symptoms get blunted. The range between the symptomatic hypoglycemia and the sympathetic adrenal discharge, which is at 68 milligram to be precise, you see, and the neuroglycopenia, which is at 40 or 35, 40, that that gap becomes very narrow in old people. It is only 10 milligram gap. So they go straight into neuroglycopenia, which is dangerous because there is no warning, no warning. And sometimes they're living alone, it is very dangerous. And as you saw, hypoglycemia increases with age, as they have shown by, I think not countries, but slide, uh, hypoglycemia increases with age. So this is very important for you to be careful in elderly people. And, uh, and of course, hypoglycemia, uh, unawareness, is a problem. Very intensively treated people can become unaware, long-standing diabetics, type 1 especially become hypoglycemia, unaware. So you have to be very careful. Somebody talks, keep talking about beta blocker, and autonomic nervous system. That is not that important, let me tell you. So if that happens, you have to be very careful in planning your therapy, insulin therapy. And of course, sometimes we have to really relax the control for about two to three weeks to restore some recognition of hypoglycemia. But remember, when you do that, what do you do next? I, to my mind, you will have to revise the, revise, if it keeps happening, revise the glycemic target upwards. It's an indication that you revise it upwards. Instead of seven, less than seven, let it be 7.5, even eight, because patient is going into bad hypoglycemia on the witness. So I think with that, so I think how to restore it, I'm not going to details of any of the topic. You see, and uh, and uh, I think we uh, very quickly so we'll go to the key points in, in the interest of time. So hypoglycemia is a frequent event with insulin therapy, as compared to OAD or GLB-1 analog, or now I would say SGLT2 inhibitors is risky immediately to the life, really, and 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 uh, subsequently to brain or to cardiac events, and then to minimize it, you improve your insulin. So Stay close to physiology. You see, uh, I'll take one minute. Yeah, sorry. I'm just finishing. I use adequate. Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. One or two minutes. Use adequate dose of basal insulin. This I told you very important. We don't use basal insulin properly. So that you can, you know, because there is less intense hypo with basal. So while there is very intensive hypo with regular and fast acting insulin. So use basal a little more proper proportion, use better insulin with less permission of variation. I'm hoping to some more improvement even today in that and synthesize patient to insulin with hypoglycemic agents, oral hypoglycemic agents. This is very, very important, very important. The key to success is that. And how to use sulfonyl urea, I gave you the key. You see, they don't use baby pride for God's sake. Don't use modified glycogen. It's the wrong thing to use. It's short acting, short acting drugs. You see, Less charge of hypo, the control of prandial glucose. You see, this is, this goes against the industry because the industry is trying to sell the modified forms, you know, because they provide more money in it. So I'm sorry, but then we should know what we need. So we stick to that, you see, and please set realistic A1C goal. So I think, and then of course, just situation, hypoglycemia, be very careful. Elderly subject, be very careful. Hypoglycemia, unawareness, be very careful. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. I'm happy to take some questions if you, if you permit for a minute or two, I'll take some questions. No, no.